The Great Second Advent Movement by J. N. Lothborough, Chapter 19. By their fruits ye shall know them. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 13. When the Savior placed the gifts of his Spirit in the church to accomplish as it pleased him the work of the Lord until the perfect day should come, he did not leave his people to guess whether a manifestation was from heaven or from evil spirits, but he gives rules by which we might know whether the Spirit was of God or not. Even in these last days, when, as predicted by the prophet Joel, the Lord was to pour out his Spirit upon all flesh, and both sons and daughters should prophesy. Joel 2, verses 28 and 29. Paul says the people should not despise prophesyings, but should prove all things and hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 20 and 21. How else can such manifestations be tested but by comparing them with the scriptural rules for discerning the work of God's Spirit? Everything that is above the comprehension of finite minds is not necessarily from God. For the Bible declares that in the last days Satan will work miracles to deceive the world that he may gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16 verse 14. It is then by a careful comparison of the manifestation with the Bible rules that a true spiritual gift may be known. The same care is requisite in this, that men of the world use in detecting counterfeit money. Detecting counterfeit money. In the Detroit Bank Note Reporter of April 1863, Mr. Preston gave five rules for detecting counterfeits and declared that any person who would make a rigid inspection of every bill that came into possession, according to these rules, need never fear of being deceived. There is no surer way to prove a prophetic gift than by comparing it with the description of such gifts as were manifested in Scripture times and testing it by the rules therein given. The Scriptures thoroughly furnish us unto all good works, 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, and give a correct record of the manifestations of the gift of prophecy and how the true work of the Spirit of God may be known from the workings of Satan with his spurious gifts. Rules for Discerning True Gifts The Lord has given in His Word at least seven distinct rules by which genuine manifestations of the Spirit of God may be distinguished from the working of Satan. Rule 1. Special Instruction The prophet Isaiah, in speaking of affairs existing in the last days, says, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead, to the law, and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah eight sixteen through 20. In this scripture, attention is called to a people engaged in restoring the seal to God's law, a people who are waiting upon the Lord engaged in his service. They are looking for him, that is, they are looking for his coming, this too in a time when spirits professing to be spirits of the dead are asking the people to seek to them. 
Some heed their call and seek to the dead for knowledge, but the Lord invites his people to seek him. That is virtually saying that if they seek him, he will give them special instruction. They need not seek to the dead, who can give them no information, for neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun, and the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9, verses 6 and 5. In the above scripture, a rule is given by which all communications are to be tested. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. All communications from the Lord will speak in harmony with his word and his law. Applying this rule to the writings of Mrs. White, I would say that during the last 52 years, I have carefully read her testimonies, comparing them with the law of God and the testimonies of the Bible, and I find the most perfect harmony between the two. Her instructions do not come in to give any new revelation to take the place of the Scripture, but rather to show us where and how in these times the position that the testimonies of Mrs. White occupy can be best told in what she herself has written respecting them. Quote, the word of God is sufficient to enlighten the most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. But notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plainest teachings. Then to leave men and women without excuse... God gives plain and pointed testimonies, bringing them back to the word that they have neglected to follow. The word of God abounds in general principles for the formation of correct habits of living, and the testimonies, general and personal, have been calculated to call their attention more especially to these principles. You are not familiar with the scriptures. If you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. The Lord designs to warn you, to reprove, to counsel through the testimonies given, and to impress your minds with the importance of the truth of his word. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has, through the testimonies, simplified the great truths already given, and in his own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be without excuse. The testimonies are not to belittle the word of God, but to exalt it and to attract minds to it, that the beautiful simplicity of truth may impress all. If the people who now profess to be God's peculiar treasure would obey his requirements, all specified in his word, special testimonies would not be given to awaken them to their duty and impress upon them their sinfulness and their fearful danger in neglecting to obey the word of God. Close quote. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, Number 33, Pages 663 to 667. Rule Number 2, True Prophets. We have already learned that all true prophets will speak in harmony with the law of God in the testimony of His Word. The Apostle John gives another rule describing the teaching of true prophets. He says, Beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby ye know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already 
is it in the world. 1 John 4 verses 1 through 3. Note carefully the foregoing scripture. It does not say that whosoever confesseth that Jesus Christ did come in the flesh, but is come in the flesh. That is, that he comes by his Spirit and dwells in us in response to our faith. This, in fact, is the central truth of the gospel. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 3, verse 17, Colossians 1, verse 27. The practical theme found in all the writings of Mrs. White is the necessity of Christ as an indwelling Savior if we would make any advancement in the heavenly way. Her writings teach the necessity of Christ first, last, and all the time. As an illustration of this fact, attention is called to her book, Steps to Christ, of which more than 100,000 copies have been sold in the English language to say nothing of the thousands of copies in the 18 foreign languages in which it is now printed. A Presbyterian minister, having read the book, ordered over 300 copies for his church members and friends and said, quote, This book was written by someone who is well acquainted with the Lord Jesus Christ. Close quote. Rule number three, false prophets. John gives a rule for detecting false prophets. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. 1 John 4, verse 5. The teaching of false prophets will pander to the carnal heart instead of exalting the self-denying and cross-bearing way. False prophets will teach smooth things instead of exalting the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 30, verses 10 and 11. Anyone who reads even a few pages of Mrs. White's writings can see that they are in the line of self-denial and cross-bearing and not of a nature to please a worldly, carnal heart. Rule number four, suffering and patience. In tracing this subject still further, we will take as a fourth rule the words of the Apostle James. Take, my brethren, to prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. James 5, verse 10. When we read of the experience of those ancient prophets, we learn that one of the greatest of their trials was to see Israel reject or to go contrary to the plain testimonies born to them. A brief study of those times will show at once the character of both true and and false prophets. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto you, they make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Jeremiah 23, verse 16. There is nothing in the writings of Mrs. White to make the reader vain, but as expressed by another, quote, I have received great spiritual benefit times, without number from the testimonies. Indeed, I never read them without feeling reproved for my lack of faith in God, lack of devotion, and lack of earnestness in saving souls. Close quote. Surely then, the effect of Mrs. White's testimonies is vastly different from that of the teachings of false prophets as described by Jeremiah. The prophet tells us also how false prophets will teach. They say still unto them that despise me, The Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come unto you. This is verse 14 of Jeremiah 23. As to the nature of Mrs. White's teaching in her testimonies, I will quote the following words from a careful reader. Quote, I have read all her testimonies through and through, most of them many times, and I have never been able to find one immoral sentence in the whole of them or anything that is not strictly pure and Christian, nothing that leads anyone from the Bible or from Christ, 
But there I find the most earnest appeals to obey God, to love Jesus, to believe the Scriptures, and to search them constantly. Such nearness to God, such earnest devotion, such solemn appeals to live a holy life can only be prompted by the Spirit of God. Close quote. A careful observer of her testimonies from the first writes, quote, In the matter of plain and faithful dealing, without fear or favor, I desire to bear witness that there has been no lack. If base and evil motives were the controlling power in this work, flattering words would fill the place of searching testimonies and faithful reproofs. Plainness of speech, faithful reproofs for wrong, words of compassion and encouragement for the trembling souls who feel their need of the Savior and for the erring who seek in humility to put away their faults, these are the things that have entered largely into her labors. The testimony of Mrs. White reproving wrongs in the case of many persons whom she has seen in vision has been borne with great faithfulness and with the most excellent effect. Close quote. This is J.N. Andrews in the Review and Herald of December 1867. Rule number five. True prophecies are fulfilled. There is a statement made by Moses relative to true and false prophets found in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. He says, How shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Deuteronomy 8, verses 21 and 22. The same thing is also found in the following scriptures. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? This is Lamentations 3, verse 37. Of the prophet Samuel, it was said, All that he saith cometh surely to pass. 1 Samuel 9, verse 6. When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Jeremiah 28, verse 9. It is now over 53 years since the writer first saw Mrs. E. G. White in prophetic vision. During these years, many prophetic statements have been made by her relative to things that would take place. Some of these predictions relate to events already fulfilled and some are in process of fulfillment while others are still future. As to those relating to the past or present events, I know not of a single instance of failure. Some of her predictions have already been noted. Others will appear in succeeding chapters as we continue our narrative. Rule number six, miracles are not a test of a true prophet. It has been affirmed by many theological writers and stated in commentaries on the scriptures that the sign of a true prophet is the working of miracles. We have yet to learn from the scriptures a rule of this character. If the working of miracles is proof of a true prophet, then the false prophet mentioned in Revelation 19 verse 20 would be declared, after all, a true prophet. For it is said, The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. The same power is spoken of again in Revelation 13, verse 14, as deceiving them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. By the same application of this rule, we should be driven to the conclusion that even Satan is a true prophet. Certain spirits will do a special work under the sixth of the seventh last plagues are called the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, verse 14. If 
the proof of a true prophet is to be found in the miracles he performs while out of vision, we should find but few of the Bible prophets who would stand the test, especially if the decision is to rest upon what is recorded concerning their works. It is true that miracles are recorded as being wrought by some of the prophets, as in the case of Elijah, Elisha, and Paul. But who has found a record in the Bible of the miracles of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, etc.? Yet these were true prophets of the Lord and are shown to be such by the rules the Lord has given as the test of a true prophet. That the working of miracles is not the test of a true prophet is clearly seen by reading the scripture record of John the Baptist. That he was a prophet is shown by the prediction of his father Zacharias in relating the vision God had given him respecting the son that should be born to him. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Luke 1 verse 76. Our Savior himself recognized John as that very prophet who should prepare the way before him. For of John he said, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, Luke 7, verses 26 to 28. Here, then, is a plain statement of the Savior that John was a prophet. Let us apply the test of miracle working and see the result. In the gospel as written by John the Evangelist, we have these words, And many resorted unto him, Christ, and said, John did no miracle. But all things that John spake of this man were true. John 10, verse 41. This statement alone is a complete refutation of the claim that a sign of a true prophet is the working of miracles. This rule given in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 3, which we denominate as Rule 6 in our present enumeration, is to guard against running after anything wonderful or miraculous until we first carefully notice whether its tendency is to greater nearness to the Lord or to a drawing away from Him. This text virtually tells us to apply all the rules, especially to see if it is in harmony with God and His law. This sixth rule teaches that if a miracle is wrought by a pretender, there will be seen with it, when carefully tested, a departure from the sacred truths of God's word and a lowering of the standard to meet a heart inclined to shun the way of self-denial. The Lord permits such a pretender to arise, and his course is a test to the true child of God, giving him an opportunity to weigh carefully the tendency or motive of said miracle worker. Those who cling to God's word, instead of being captivated by the false miracle worker, come forth strong in God as the result of such experience. In these evil days, when many are claiming to be faith healers, divine healers, Christian science healers, etc., it would be well to apply closely the scriptural rules, for it will need divine rules and the illumination of the Holy Spirit to enable us clearly to discern the intent and purpose of some of these healers so subtle in their work, while on the other hand are those who openly disregard God's law and his truth for this time. In some instances, these pretended healers have raged like men filled with madness and even a mention of the law of God.
As surely as the Lord has a message proclaiming his holy law, so surely are the men destitute of the movings of the Holy Spirit who rail against his law and thrust from their presence those who even mention it. Rule number seven, their fruits. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. These words of our Savior recognize the fact that the gift of prophecy would exist in the gospel age. If no true prophets were to be connected with the work, and every prophetic manifestation was to be from an evil source, would he not have said, Beware of prophets? The fact that he tells us so definitely how each kind may be known is the best of evidence that in the work of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, in showing things to come, John 16, verse 13, would be the true gift of prophecy. This rule, which in our enumeration we have called Rule 7, is an infallible one. Christ did not say, Ye may know them by their fruits, but positively, By their fruits ye shall know them. We inquire, What is the fruit to be seen in the work of genuine gifts of the Spirit of God? The answer is found in the statement of Paul respecting the purpose of the Lord in placing the gifts in the church. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity, into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, verses 8 through 13. Apply this rule to the prophetic gift that has been connected with the third angel's message from its rise, and what is the result? We find that the continual instruction given through Mrs. White has been in the line of unity and harmony, admonishing to counsel together and to press together, to be in unison with Christ, thus ensuring true fellowship and union with one another. Some of the opponents of this work have tauntedly said, quote, If it was not for the visions of Mrs. White, which you have among you, your cause would have gone to pieces long ago. Close quote. It is replied, that is true, because from that source the Lord has given counsel, caution, and light, and thus dissensions have been removed and the work has prospered. So what they have designed as a thrust against the gift is in reality testimony that its fruit is that of the true gift of prophecy. For sixty years and more, Have the manifestations of the gift of prophecy through Mrs. White been tested by these seven rules, and in every particular they have met the specifications required of a true prophecy. This is the end of chapter 19.